Um, so this morning we are going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 12, and so would encourage you to join me there. I'm going to try a little screen share. So let's see what happens here. And um, if I can do this. Okay. All right. So hopefully you can see this screen. And uh, that will just give us uh, a few uh, little notes that we can uh, uh, follow along with this morning. Okay. Uh, let me begin with the word of prayer and then I'm going to read from Matthew 12. Heavenly Father, thank you for everyone who has participated in the service thus far, and I pray that you would guide us now in these moments as we would seek to learn uh, some more things from your word to meditate even a little bit further on, on uh, this passage in front of us, and, and I pray that you would uh, use this to spur us on in our walk with you. Uh, Lord, it may be that we are struggling with certain things today. And uh, we ask for your Holy Spirit to minister to our heart in that particular place of need, that we would uh, seek you and that we would um, draw near to you in these moments, recognizing that your words are far more important than what anyone else could, could say or any other book. Um, your words are life to us and we, um, we need them and we rely upon them. So we, we trust in you today to guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to begin reading at verse 15 and go to verse 21. And you will notice um, uh, many of these verses were also a part of the passage that was read earlier from Isaiah 40. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles, he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. We'll stop there this morning. There is uh, um, some things to be aware of in context here, right there in verse 15, Jesus aware of this. Well, what is he aware of? Well, if you go back, uh, verse 14 tells us the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. There is, uh, as we talked about uh, recently at the last time, we uh, understand that there are some who have already chosen to reject Jesus at this particular point. And they are mounting an effort now to destroy him. And it's, a, it's fairly strong language that's used there. Jesus, though, um, is certainly aware of what was taking place, as it says, but this was not the appointed time for him to, uh, to go to the cross. There were some other things that were to take place in God's sovereign plan before the cross would, uh, would be there. And so, uh, we see these moments where Jesus is, is uh, at times telling others not to say anything, and, and then other times where they, they freely uh, declare who he is and make him known. So uh, we're going to just look at the passage today, understanding what Jesus is, is saying, and these verses that he is quoting from Isaiah, trying to understand them. I've kind of chosen, huh, chosen as a key verse here, verse 18a, where it says, Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, uh, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. And, and just kind of focusing on some things there. So let me, um, let me say as I begin, let me tell you that today is, um, I'm, I'm extra excited today. 
And the reason that I am extra excited is because uh, um, my son, Stephen, uh, is going to be coming home uh, today, or he, it'll be tomorrow before we see him, but he's leaving NBBI uh, this afternoon. We've already heard about their graduation today. And so Stephen will be traveling home this afternoon. I'll be excited to see him. It's been quite a while since we've actually uh, seen him and we'll uh, look forward to doing lots of things uh, together as a family uh, while he's home this summer. And uh, he and I will uh, be able to uh, hopefully get involved in all sorts of fun things together. And I'm uh, looking forward to that. So I just told you about my son, okay? So that's an important thing for where we're going today, okay? That's an important thing. All right, so let me, uh, let me just kind of scroll along here. In verses 15 and 16, uh, just focusing on those for just a moment, we see that Jesus withdrew from that opposition that I was talking about. He did not do this out of any kind of fear. It wasn't that he was afraid for his physical life, as, as you and I might um, be afraid of, of some impending doom or something that is on the horizon. He, he was not afraid of that, but it just it was not the appointed time for him to go to the cross, as I, as I just mentioned. And so, um, what do we have Jesus doing? Being very deliberate very intentional with everything he does and everything he said. There are no mistakes, no accidents, no, no coincidences. Everything is by God's design. And that is helpful for us to understand uh, by God's design. And so he went and, and, and drew uh, away from the opposition at this particular time. But what happens uh, with we see it over and over again in the Gospels. Many follow him. And so there are some who are, um, they, they want to get away from him. They've had enough of him. And there are others who are drawn to him. Just a question for you this morning, you know, uh, would be, uh, what group would you find yourself in? Uh, are you one who is drawn toward Jesus or one who wants to push him away? Um, sometimes, even though we may uh, say that we are a people of faith, sometimes we really just don't want any of um, that closeness that would come from a relationship with, with Jesus. We, we don't talk about him. We don't spend time in the word. We don't pray, uh, those sorts of things. We, we kind of push them away. Um, but there are others who would instead be drawn to those very same uh, qualities of, of Jesus that, would, that others might be stumbling over. And, and I hope this morning that you are in the group who would be drawn toward Jesus and be amongst that group who uh, would, would want to hear what he has to say. And those that come were often the broken ones of the ones who were struggling in, in life, and, and Jesus clearly was willing to spend time with them, whereas the other religious leaders were not. So many followed and were healed, uh, but they were told not to make him known at this particular time, and we've already mentioned that. So here's the question then, who is the best one to describe who Jesus is? Who, who do you think? Would that be, mm, would it maybe be the disciples who would be the ones that would be the best to uh, describe who Jesus is because they spent so much time with him. They listened to him. They, they watched him. They participated in, in that, a lot of activities together. Um, they would certainly know many things about who Jesus is. And yet, and yet, we also know that often the disciples do not understand and that they struggled in their own level of, why is he doing that? Why is he saying that? Why does he want to go there? Last time, he, he went there, they tried to kill him. Why does he want to go back there? Those sorts of things. And so the disciples would certainly have a unique perspective, but not necessarily the best uh, perspective. And we'll talk about that in a moment. What about, what about those who have been changed by him? Certainly, uh, they would uh, be ones who have a great perspective 
and uh, would be able to describe certain things about Jesus. You know, um, he healed people. We just mentioned that. So wouldn't they be the ones who could say, yeah, look at how he's changed me. I used to be this way. Now I'm this way. And it's all because of Jesus. And you and I would be able to say the same thing as those whose lives lives have been changed by him as we have come to faith in Christ and Christ alone. So we could we could certainly describe certain things about who Jesus is, uh, but are, are we the best ones to be able to describe uh, who Jesus is? And so let's, uh, let's listen to what John chapter one would have to say. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Um, John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Now, that's a very interesting verse, but it's telling us that the, the Father is the one who has revealed the Son to us. The way that we can know the Son is by knowing the Father. The way that we can know the Father is by the Son. And, and uh, he has, uh, the Father has revealed Jesus to us. And so, um, how does the Father describe the Son. That's what we want to ask, because it would seem to us that the absolute best one who could describe who Jesus is, is the Heavenly Father who sent him. Uh, and so uh, this passage is, is unique in that it gives us a bit of a, we can listen in a little bit to how the Father describes the Son. So in this passage of scripture, Jesus is described by the Father as a chosen servant who will carry out God's plan of redemption for the world, who will carry out God's plan of redemption for the world. So how does he do this? Jesus, as this chosen servant then, well, it tells us here that the Father is pleased with Jesus. Did you notice that? Uh, as we As we... Use these verses from Matthew 12, which were a prophecy from Isaiah 42 about who the Messiah would be and what he would be like. And it's telling us here, as God speaks through the prophet, he says, behold, my servant whom I have chosen. And then he refers to him as my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. What a what a tremendous um, acknowledgement that is, you know. And if if you have your son or your daughter, and you are um, uh, wanting to tell someone else about them, uh, you would certain certainly want to then share uh, those important qualities that you see in them, and you would be thankful, and you would say, "I'm so I'm so proud of so and so, and and I'm so thankful for who they are." And here's what they have done, or here's what I see in them, those sorts of things. Here we have the Heavenly Father, and, and I know that this is hard for us to think about as we think about the Trinity. Um, it, it's hard for us to grasp, and we won't fully be able to grasp it, yet there are certain things that we can understand. So here we have the Father who is thrilled with Jesus. He's pleased with him. He is uh, seeing uh, his his own character in him, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, the Triune God is is rejoicing here over over Jesus and who He is. Now, does this remind anybody of another incident where something similar like this took place? Um, nod your head if you're thinking of Jesus' baptism. And what happened there as John the Baptist baptized Jesus, they're standing in the water and we have the voice of the father. Uh, this is my beloved son in whom uh, I'm well pleased, you know, listen to him. 
And then we have the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. You have, um, again, God's favor being shown there as uh, the Trinity is fully represented. Okay, so the, the Father is pleased with the Son. Um, notice that in that, in that verse 15, um, we were talking about Trinity a little bit. And it's, it's all around us here. Uh, the Holy Spirit is upon him. That is another way that, that Jesus is described. Just catch the phrase in, in the middle of verse, sorry, I keep saying verse 15, but it's really verse 18. I apologize for that. And halfway through that verse, uh, it says, I will put my spirit upon him. I will put my spirit upon him. Now, who's who's speaking that? Uh, the Father. And he's saying, I will put my spirit. Who's that? That's the Holy Spirit. And upon who? Upon Jesus. Isn't that cool? In one little line, you've got the Trinity uh, reflected there. And, you know, sometimes, again, that's a hard concept for us to grasp. It, it, it is uh, something that we... Uh, struggle to just point to in, in a particular verse. And yet there are so many verses that, that do this sort of thing where each aspect of God, each, each part of the Trinity, um, each person of, of God is reflected here. And so it's just a beautiful phrase. I will put my spirit upon him. Okay, so who is Jesus? Well, uh, he's one whom the Father is pleased with, and he's one who the Holy Spirit was upon. And, and Jesus was given power then uh, from the Holy Spirit. And, of course, that, that becomes significant then as we uh, move forward in the Gospels and as we see, say, Gospel um, of John, you know, where Jesus talks about the relationship that he has with the Father as we think uh, John 15 through 17, and some of the discussion that's happening there. All right, how else is Jesus described by the Father? Well, it talks here about justice for all the nations. It says he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles, to the nations, to all who um, are around. Uh, the gospel is not uh, simply a Jewish uh, thing, even though it certainly was offered to the Jews at that particular time. And will be once again, but we have this uh, this proclamation here that the ministry of Jesus extends far beyond simply one particular geographical area, and that's a great uh, uh, missionary proclamation here as well as a couple of times in this passage it speaks about the nations. So there is a sense of justice in which uh, the, the wrong will be made right. And Jesus is one who uh, has been given authority in that sense from the Father to be able to be judge of all the earth. And, and that will take place later on. But listen to a familiar passage in Micah. Uh, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? So he is one who uh, will be just. Jesus is one who is just and will accomplish that and will do what is right, and will speak what is right uh, to those who were around him at that time. And as, as we look forward to the future, we will see that judgment once again. Okay, as we continue on, then it, it tells us that Jesus is one who is gentle and compassionate. Uh, because it, it says here that he's, he's not one who's going to quarrel or cry aloud, 
Um, he's not just coming to, Jesus came, did not just come to um, start an argument with people. That, that's not his character. Instead, um, he often posed uh, questions, right? And we see that in so many different scenarios and events. He would, he would do things, he would say things, he would certainly uh, speak. But his point in coming was not to be just one who would argue with people and not accomplish anything. No, instead, as it tells us in verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. So he is one who is gentle. Think of a, a little flame. And if you're not careful, that little candle or whatever it is that is lit, it, that that flame is so small, it's just going to be gone. It's just going to be snuffed out if you're not careful. And so you got to make sure there's no wind, no breeze there. Um, and, and just needs to be gently nurtured along, and protected and cared for. Or a, a, a bruised reed, um, the idea that there's, uh, uh, think of a plant that, is already somewhat torn. And if, if you're not careful, it's gonna be completely separated from the, the rest of the plant. And it's just hanging on. And so that's, that's a picture of how we feel sometimes in our lives and in our world and circumstances around us. We can feel so weak and defeated that we are uh, just barely holding on. And uh, there may be some of you that feel that way today. Certainly we live in a strange time right now and it would not be surprising for some of you to feel uh, just so weak that you wonder how much longer you can carry on with a particular situation or whatever you might have going on in your life. And yet our savior meets us in that moment. He is gentle with us and compassionate with us. See, his strongest words were spoken to those who uh, were self-righteous and, and uh, did not see a need for a savior. But when he came across those who were broken and knew they were broken, he wanted to do everything he could to help them. And, and he showed compassion to them. And that is certainly our savior. So we see that. Not only do we see that, but that brings hope then. And it talks about in his name, the Gentiles will hope in verse 21. And so there, there is a very clear sense of hope for the future, uh, hope beyond the immediate situation that we can trust in God and God will provide what is needed for us. And uh, what is God's provision? His provision is Jesus. Jesus is the one that we need. And so that is so significant and so important for us. Well, as we, as we quickly move uh, toward a conclusion here, we would say, this means for you and I that we can have comfort in our struggles, comfort in our struggles. And we've already talked some about that. If you're struggling today, you can find your comfort in Jesus. Remember, we, we just read in, in chapter 11 that a couple of weeks back, that uh, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We can find comfort. Uh, secondly, we can also have assurance of God's plan of salvation. Remember that what we're seeing here is words that are spoken by God the Father, words that are spoken about Jesus, uh, accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit, spoken by a prophet, a prophet Isaiah, the words of God from uh, from God to Isaiah and, and through Jesus and to us today even. And we, we can find so much encouragement and assurance in, in the fact that God knows what he's doing. And Jesus going to the cross was no accident. It was very much a part of the plan of God. Um, and you and I can be so thankful for that. And we'll take a, a moment in a moment to just give thanks again to God as we Take time for communion. Uh, we can have hope for the future. Please do not uh, be so weighed down by the present that we cannot see beyond it. We continue to look toward the future. And you and I have to do that in our lives. Uh, we trust in God. 
And we know that God's perspective looks beyond just what we can immediately see. And uh, there are good things in store for those who know the Lord. So how does the Father describe us? Well, we won't spend long here, but I simply read this as we close. First uh, John says, what kind of love the Father has given to us that, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. You and I can find so much joy in how God uh, has revealed the Son to us and that through God's plan of salvation, you and I are privileged to be called his children. And uh, I, this passage that Jesus spoke, that quoted, was fulfilled in himself. And it's a beautiful reminder of the hope that you and I can have in Jesus Christ as well. Let's pray together, and then we're going to transition to a time of communion. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for Jesus. We thank you for these words from the prophet Isaiah that spoke about that chosen servant, that one who would be the Messiah. We thank you that the only one who could fulfill that role was God himself. He came to us in human form through the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our savior. We thank you, Lord, that you have revealed him to us and that we have placed our faith in him as believers. So we cherish, we cherish our Savior and we express love to him today. In Jesus' name, 